presenting your host for the Racecoin podcast, Jay. What's going on, my Racecoin fans? I'm here with Darren Turner, a British endurance racer racing for Aston Martin Racing. Welcome to the show. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me, having me on. It's great to be here. So tell us about your driving um, experiences when you were a child. Like what got you into it and made you want to choose this as a career? Um, I don't actually think it was a, a choice as a kid to be like a, a racing driver as a career. It was very much luck. Um, I wanted to start to, well, I wanted to start karting when I was about 13. In fact, I wanted to start racing bikes before that, but my parents were like, that's not going to happen. Um, so I literally, uh, I took about a year to convince them that, um, you know, I want to go uh, karting. There's a circuit near where my parents live. And then eventually we got a cart and, uh, and it sort of started from there. But even at that point, all I was doing was watching Formula One at the weekends. And, um, you know, I didn't even know there was like a way of becoming a Formula One driver. Um, it wasn't like we had a family of people that knew what, anything about motorsport. It was like, okay, well, there's karting down the road. That looks fun. Um, and I can pretend that I'm going to be a Grand Prix driver. <laughs> but I had no idea how, how that even worked. And, and no one in the family did either. So it was more of a case of just me and my dad going up having some fun racing carts and um and I was enjoying you know preparing the cart um and sort of uh, learning about the mechanics of it all so my goal at that stage was literally to be uh if I could get into Formula One as a mechanic so that was my my sort of goal and the karting was very much something on the side um and it sort of progressed um and I obviously had a, enough talent to um to do a good job uh, and then lots of things happened that sort of gave me that opportunity to sort of end up being a professional, basically. So when did you, I mean, it sounds like it was, uh, as you mentioned, a bit of luck, but at what point did you decide, you know what, like, I'm ready to turn this into a career rather than kind of going down some other normal route? Um, I don't think I decided. It was, it was uh, again, it's just an opportunity. Um, so uh, when I was about 18, I started work at, uh, Jordan Grand Prix. So in 1991, they were their first year in Formula One. I was sort of a, maybe a 17 or something, but um, I'd just done one year at a, a small uh, Honda dealership working there as an apprentice and was lucky enough to get an opportunity to go and work at Jordan Grand Prix. So I moved up to Silverstone. And, you know, at that point, I thought, I'm set. You know, at some stage, I might it. be factory <laughs> but Yeah, I'm set for my aspirations, which were to be in Formula One and to be a race mechanic. So I knew it was going to take a number of years to be factory based, but at least I had my foot in the door. I had a job there and, you know, that there hopefully will be an opportunity to, for me to join the race team. At the same time, the car team was going okay. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a point where probably we were about to stop doing it because I was at, you know, 18, 17, 18 and um, uh, moved away from home, had a career. Uh, in Formula One and just starting out and it was like okay well we'll carry on for a bit but when I moved up to Silverstone there's obviously so many people there with all the experience and been around motor racing for forever uh, they gave me the opportunity to to go along to the Jim Russell Racing School up at Donington just to try my hand from moving from karting into single seaters um, and it's a week-long course the people at Jordan Grand Prix, Silverstone, the other little race teams that are based up there at the time they all clubbed together and and bought me a week at uh, at this Jim Russell Racing School at Donington. That's and that's where it's, uh, yeah, it was great. I mean, I was obviously a little cheeky lad that was going around and promising that, you know, if they gave me 20 quid, I'll, I'll return 40 quid in a couple of years' time or something like that. But <laughs> effectively got, got the budget together um, and went on and did this Jim Russell Racing School and, and showed enough talent on that that gave me the sort of, um, I guess, gave me the direction that, you know, actually... I actually now understand a little bit about the sport. I know about the lower rungs, so Formula Ford, Fox or Lotus at the time, you know, I can see a ladder. Um, and so that gave me sort of the, see that Jim Russell Racing School the week there and, and winning, they have a little final race at the end of the week, uh, winning that. And then uh, I sort of basically um, came back to Silverstone, carried on working at Jordan Grand Prix, but my eye was on how I find a budget to go racing. And, and it sort of, uh, it sort of, um, gained momentum from that point there and uh, eventually I had to leave during Grand Prix. I was spending so much time on the phone trying to do deals, trying to find money to go racing that they said, you know, your, your mind's not on your job here. Mm. You can always come back to this type of job. So why don't you go and give this whole sort of driving Let's thing? Properly, yeah, um, yeah, 100%. So I sort of, Jordan Grand Prix were on the, their factories 
opposite Silverstone Circuit. So I sort of packed my stuff walked in across. there, <laughs> walked across the Silverstone Circuit, got a job yeah. there at the racing school, and, and basically it sort of it snowballed from there. And um, you know, I've just had a uh, a lot of lucky opportunities, made the most of those opportunities. And um, yeah, I, I happened to be in Formula Renault at a point when I was with a successful team a couple of years later and I won the Young Driver Award and McLaren Auto Sport BRDC Award in 96. And that was really the turning point that gave me um, the springboard to sort of making a professional career, basically. Sounds like, um, you know, uh, many people that I speak to have a very f- almost fortunate path that they call it, you know, a lot of luck, a lot of right place, right time, you know, a lot of things going right for them. And I guess, you know, that's led you on to things like, um, you know, being part of the GT championship. Um, if you could talk us through a little bit about that as well. Yeah. I mean, uh, I sort of ended up at uh, Aston Martin racing in 2004. They started racing in 2005, but you know, I, I think my professional career really started in 97. I started getting paid to drive cars. And in 2000, I started getting paid to, to race cars. So I did DTM with Mercedes for two years. Had a year in sports car racing after that um, and sort of showed enough potential that, you know, I got picked up by ProDrive, which we were running a couple of Ferraris at that time. And that ProDrive turned into Aston Martin Racing, basically. And, um, and I've been there ever since. So, again, it was one of those things. I came out of DTM um, after a couple of years of touring cars. And like most drivers, you don't really choose where you end up you know everyone wants to get to formula one but there isn't that many opportunities and the likelihood of it actually happen is is really small so at some point that dream goes and you're trying to earn a living um, and trying to pay your bills and trying to progress and yeah you'll take any opportunity and you know i was lucky enough to find a a couple of sports car rides um, Mm. in 2002 um and that gained the sort of momentum in, in sports car and gt racing and and so i've been with aston martin racing since um since they started in 2005 and obviously the testing program in 2004 yeah as a development driver right so um, many of the things that you've done for them have uh, just kind of excelled your career i guess as well i mean you've won Le Mans three times um you know it's, it's it's been quite the career so talk us through some of these wins like what is um what was it like uh on during your first time and you know getting these titles um yeah, I think, you know, the, the win in 2007 was always pretty special. There's so much pressure in 2005 and six, and we sort of had a number of issues. Um, some of the drivers, including myself, making mistakes. Um, and then obviously things with the, the cars. Some 2007, there was huge pressure to, to get a result. Um, and it, the whole year was focused about that event. Um, and, you know, we had a great race with uh, against Corvette in GT1. The weather conditions were changing and uh, you know, I was paired with uh, Ricard Rydell and David Brabham. Great teammates, experienced teammates, super fast. And um, yeah, it all sort of fell down into the last hour when the, the sort of heavens opened. And um, yeah, Brabham did a great job to from Corvette, keep the car on the track and uh, bring the car across the line for the first win. So yeah, those sort of periods are really special in your career because they sort of define what your career is basically. But there's been other races which, for me, have been personally more challenging, but also I've enjoyed more because of, of, of that challenge. Um, but certainly the three wins at Le Mans have always been you know, a massive highlight for me in terms of um, it says what my career has been. It's certainly been defined by sports car racing and obviously racing with Aston Martin Racing. So, um, yeah, I've enjoyed that. And, you know, the recent win in 2017 with the, the Fantis GTE, I'd say that was even more special because the field was stronger. Um, the GT1 days, there was only really Corvette and occasionally one or two other cars that were really sort of competitive. But mm. in 17, certainly since um, WC's been running, the competition within GTEs kept growing each year. And in 2017, it was it was at its height. You know, it's, equally, it's there right now as well, but it was probably at its, its sort of first time of being as as competitive as as it is right now so um that was very encouraging for us to be on the pace over that race weekend the vantage was in its last race as well so you know it hadn't we'd won other races in the wc championship but mm-hmm. it hadn't actually won at le mans um so there was a bit of pressure there to try and get that last uh, win at that point just before the car sort of um 
gets sort of turned into a, a classic and uh, we moved on to the new vantage so uh, yeah it was it was a lovely weekend in 2017 and and you know Johnny Adam did a great job in that last stint to sort of snatch the lead from uh, from Corvette with one and a half laps to go yeah i mean it's it's been uh, one of these uh, <clears throat> experiences where it defines you but at the same time you have this kind of um as you mentioned uh, races that really meant a lot more to you so what makes a race or those challenges mean more to you in some sense than uh you know a race that is a bit more grandiose and people kind of just see that as the as the biggest victory essentially i think the the special ones for me are when you can look at your own individual performance so especially when you're doing sports cars you, there's a big team three or two other drivers three guys in the car and it's a collective of your <laughs> individual performances that will give you the result um and you know all of those wins at Le Mans, I'd certainly know I, I can feel comfortable that I've done a good job in the car and everything else. But there's been other races where we might not have ended up with the result for various reasons. But I know that my performance in that, you know, one or two hours in the car during that race has been mm. as good as I've ever achieved. So you're always looking for perfection as a driver. So that was, you know, that was the main thing. You know, I've, I can think of um, uh, Brazil. And WC race, we had a, a six hour race against the Ferrari. And I don't think at any point the cars were more than two seconds apart. And um, we didn't win, the Ferrari won it, but it was one of those races where we had to sort of do qualifying laps uh, every lap. And it was just a, a you know a great experience. Yeah, it's, it's funny how, um, you know, certain races and certain events just mean more, even though, you know, the titles are just a, a lot more glamorous in some sense, I guess, as well. And, um, Part of this, obviously, as you mentioned, is about being a perfectionist when it comes to racing, right? Which means you have to keep self-improving on, on yourself. Um, what's your take on how to have that sort of mindset of self-improvement, perfectionism, trying to actually keep beating on your craft to try and becoming um, that person that you want to be in the car uh, for your team and, you know, for everyone else? I think, uh, you know, you're development as a human is always ongoing um and if you sort of rest on your laurels then you've sort of you've given up basically so the nice thing is you know i'm i'm getting towards the end of my racing career i've had nearly 20 years of being a professional um and there's a the new sort of generation of drivers have come into to aston martin racing and it's good for me because i'm learning new things you know they do things different you know their approach is different um their driving technique is sometimes a bit different so you know you you if like for me, I've been doing you know what I've been doing for a long time, and always trying to evolve and always trying to to sort of improve and a lot from from the next generation as well. So I've enjoyed that sort of that fresh impetus into the team um, and sort of the, the different ideas that everyone sort of brings along. How is it different? Like, what is the what is um, examples of things that people have brought from um, the new generation, as you're describing them, uh, that I'll bring to the table? Uh, well quite a lot of them come from different manufacturers you know they've been racing with different manufacturers so they've got different learnings and they've experienced with different uh, teammates as well um, so they bring a lot of technical information as well so they sort of look at things in a different way um, it's the little detail you know especially in like a GTE car there's a lot going on with ABS and traction and control and you know the way I would have maybe asked for something has worked for a long time but then they came in and they're like well if you do it slightly different it gives you this performance and we're looking for tenths of a second yeah, microsecond. and even if it's yeah and even if it's you know a tenth the lap that they've gained then it's uh it makes a big difference on the uh, accumulation over a, yeah. a race run so you know it's that and obviously um how they use the fuel if they're more sort of economical on the fuel what they're doing to achieve this so yeah and, and you know they learn stuff of me as well so you know a lot of the the um yeah, younger drivers are all left foot breakers um generally uh, where I've sort of used left foot braking when I've been in an LMP1 car or something like that, but I've in the GT cars I've stuck with right foot braking. Now I've never seen a a sort of situation where the left foot braking has actually been a performance gain, but you know that's a different sort of driving style that people use. But also I see that you know generally left foot brakers use a bit more fuel. So you know, where I've learned little techniques of the, these guys, they've also learned about, you know, you can achieve this on your fuel target by, you know, just being a bit, bit different with your left foot braking process. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things that's really positive that you get to learn a bit mm -hmm. of each other and, and sort of uh, keep developing.
yeah, I guess like little technical things here and there that, you know, can uh, make that little bit of a difference, but overall a, a big difference. Uh, it makes so, a big uh, difference, you know, especially when we're, you think about Le Mans, you know, it's a nearly a four minute lap. And um, especially when we're sort of fighting over a couple of tenths, you know, a hour at Le Mans racing is 14 laps. If you had three tenths of laps quicker, suddenly that's, uh, you know, nearly, well, it's nearly four and a half seconds you've gained in an hour on your competitor. So, you know, that, that's, difference and that's the detail that we're all having to look at look at nowadays to be competitive mm. and i guess you know over time um as you're describing learning new things from you know the younger people right now um compared to when you were the um uh, guy who was like you know give me an extra 10 quid and i'll make you back 20 <laughs> right yeah um, so that the whole kind of journey has changed you as a person and you know i'm sure changed your um perspective about racing as well so can you talk us through some of your changes in maybe perspective or motivation throughout the course of the past uh, few decades uh yeah not sure about what's really changed you know the motivation is is still there and and that's the thing i've actually enjoyed learning about myself that i'm still hungry for performance and hungry for results you know i just come back from a dog walk you know walking around the countryside i do that near, pretty much every day and you know, on that walk, I'm thinking about, you know, I need to somehow get in a position where there's this one race I've not done. I really want to do it. I'm... Motivation is still very much there for, you know, after whatever I've been racing now, I think, you know, since karting, yeah, 31 years I've been racing now. So um, that is a good thing for me because it means I'm still love the sport I'm involved with and I'm still passionate and hungry about the results as well. So, yeah, that's something I'm learning in terms of, that I'm learning that I'm still hungry. Mm. Um, and the motivation does change in, in different ways. You know, I've got a young family now. Um, you know, beforehand, before the wife and the kids, I was, you know, just about me. But now it's about, you know, what I've got to do um, to sort of support my family as well. Want, so, yeah, yeah so it's, it changes, you know, there's a, there's a different side. And that sort of stuff is off the circuit. Um, and it's the business side of the sport, but it's still as important. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's again, another learning experience, you know, what you learn on the track is, um, only half of, of being a professional racing. And, uh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have gone through their own hurdles, own problems, um, throughout this journey. What would you say, um, to someone who's, um, starting up and, you know, hasn't understood quite what the balance means, you know, the balance that you're talking about on track versus off track. Um, what advice would you give someone who's listening uh, to try and help them make sure that the balance is there? I think it's about people, you know, um, spe especially like uh, the, the guys that are starting out in mechanics and, you know, the younger people in the sport. If you're a young driver, don't forget these guys are all got, you know, the guys and girls have all got their own aspirations. And quite often there's people that were young team members when I was a young driver who are now team bosses. So mm. you've got to be a person that, um people want to be around um enjoy your company um and you've got to be a good team player because if you're someone with a, a lot of attitude and uh you know someone that isn't a a, a people's person mm. then you're relying purely on what you do on the racetrack which yeah. will only go so far um so you've got to get the balance right and you've got to put the effort in to remember that everyone else is on a journey as well so enjoy what you're doing but also make sure the people around you are enjoying what they're doing as well because then you just pull everyone along in a positive way and and then hopefully everyone gets the gets to sort of succeed and get and achieve their goals yeah exactly and um this might be the hardest question so far right what would you have done if it wasn't racing uh i certainly would have worked in racing you know as a kid as i've mentioned before i wanted to be a race mechanic in form one so i'm 100 percent sure i would have had a life in motorsport let's let's make one, this harder let's make it harder no okay. racing no racing no, mechanic, no racing no racing no <laughs> no tires around you <laughs> um well i i think you know my choices back then would have been limited because i didn't know much about the world um and so now you know i've had that this career has given me a great opportunity to to travel the world and to meet lots of people from different parts of the world, different cultures, a different way of life as well. So from that side, um, knowing what I know now, I would have wanted to do something that meant I traveled the world um, and had the same sort of experiences I've had from motorsport as well. So, and one of the things I'm, I'm into as a, a personal interest is yachts. 
sort of arena where I could have still travelled the world, but had um, an involvement on a mechanical sort of side. So um, yeah, something which included travel basically. Mm, okay, cool. It sounds uh, sounds like a, a plan for I guess the future. So moving yeah. on to that, you're you're talking about the end of your career. Where uh, where do you see? Um, do you see a specific end time, or is it just um, you still want to finish up a few more races and tick a few more boxes, or where's uh, what's your kind of perspective on the end? Um, well, it's sort of towards the end of the career, so I've still got another three years in the current deal, um, and you know I hope I'm still competitive in those those sort of remaining three years of this deal, and then hopefully there's an opportunity just to carry on a bit further. You know, I'd like to. I think when I was younger and I started out, I was like, if I could get to 40 and being a professional race driver, that's great. Well, I've passed that a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, um, everything gets pushed back when you get now, back. Yeah, well, everything's moving back. So now I'm like, you know, you know I'd be very happy to achieve that. Um, but also, you know, the, the fact I'm sort of moving away from sort of race car development and working with Aston Martin on some of their cars and their projects on the road car side. So, you know, already I'm starting to, to look away from the racing to other areas of um, of Aston Martin as well. So, you know, I'm, I'm enjoying that sort of transitional period, but I always, you know, want to continue racing for as long as I can. Really. Of course, of course. Um, I guess uh, that's that's the best part about all of it, right? And um, in terms of your uh, perspective on how um, typically a lot of people that I've spoken to have mentioned things like, oh, I'm going to, I've done coaching now or I've started coaching or I've, you know, started like doing projects where I can teach people at the karting schools where I first began, things like that. Um, is that something that you're considering or want to do? Or is it more um, just kind of developing the actual, um, you know, working with the companies themselves and then trying to improve maybe technical aspects of cars themselves and push the industry further? Um, well, I've done a little bit of coaching at the moment, just on a, a couple of drivers that are within the Aston Martin uh, Racing Academy. So there's a few that I'm involved with as part of that program. Um, I also have a small simulator company, so that's been running 10 years. So, you know, the footfall of, of drivers through the door, uh, you know, every week there's hours and hours of uh, young drivers coming through the door that are um, uh, in the simulator. So I see that side as well. So um, although I'm not involved uh, the guys that run the program within the, the company are doing a great job there looking after these sort of uh, not just young drivers you know any drivers that come along and getting a bit of practice in the sim but for me that is more about learning about business you know that's been the, the best thing about running that um, or owning that company is that I've learned a load about the business world that I wouldn't have learned while I was still driving so you know I've seen that as a company that's given me a great um, footing for the future as well yeah. um whatever direction i do once i sort of do hang up the helmet but yeah i think some people are naturally good at coaching um you know i'm i'm okay um but i'm probably a bit too demanding sometimes so um and, and lack the patience that i i know other people have got when it comes to coaching but yeah um you know i've got a huge amount of experience so it's good to be able to pass that on you know when i started sports car racing uh, my teammate was david brabham and he was fantastic afraid that i had the performance and i had the speed he encouraged that and he helped me develop as a driver and so hopefully i'm uh, able to sort of i'm not sure i could do it to the same level as david because he was exceptional at it but you know hopefully i'll be able to sort of use that experience i've gained to be able to help the next generation i think that's a very humble way to end this podcast thank you very much for being on and it's been a pleasure having you thanks very much indeed thank you If you like this episode of the Racecoin podcast, go ahead and subscribe so you can get notified every Monday when a new episode is out. And don't forget to check us out on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter.